you have your Bible with you, we're going to be back in Hebrews chapter 13. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. We go straight through books of the Bible, and you're coming on the end of the book of Hebrews. We've been walking through it for, I don't know how many months, seven or eight probably. And we've gone verse by verse, word by word, through the book of Hebrews. Uh, Today, uh, well last week we began the last chapter of Hebrews, which is chapter 13. And uh, all through this book, we've talked about the context that, that uh, Hebrew Christians suffering persecution, uh, being um, just inundated by hardship and trial, were tempted to go back to the old covenant worship, go back to the temple and the tabernacle, and the, and the, or the temple and the priests and the sacrifices, in order to spare themselves from all of this suffering and persecution they were enduring. And the writer of Hebrews, over and over again, by showing uh, through the Old Testament pictures that Jesus is better, that Jesus is um, the fulfillment of all these things. And last week, we began chapter 13. So the last chapter of Hebrews, the end of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13, he's basically applying all of what he has said through the whole book. And in the first six verses that we looked at last week, we saw several commands that really at first glance just look like disconnected random instructions that he threw in at the end of this book. But the whole final chapter of Hebrews is bracketed by the idea of living and worshiping in a way that is pleasing or acceptable to the Lord. The last two verses of chapter 12, if you have your Bible in front of you, Uh, He said, you know, since we are are receiving this kingdom that can't be shaken, let us offer acceptable, or some of your translations may say pleasing worship service to the Lord. And then chapter 13 begins with these various commands, um, and we looked at those in 1 through 6 last week. And toward the end, the very end of the last chapter of Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 21, the writer ends the letter by saying, God will equip us to live pleasing or acceptable to the Lord. And so he uses the same word. So between these two ideas of living and worshiping in a pleasing, acceptable manner to the Lord, um, these various commands all through chapter 13 tell us how to do that, especially in times of hardship and trial and suffering, persecution, as these Hebrew Christians were enduring. So the point, really, of chapter 13 is if Jesus truly is better, as the book of Hebrews has told us all the way through, if Jesus truly is sufficient for all things, and He has given us perfect forgiveness, righteousness, acceptance, adoption through the gospel, then our lives should reflect it as we live to please the Lord who saved us. So in verses 1 through 6, we were told to... Let brotherly love continue. We were told to not neglect hospitality, showing hospitality to one another. We were told to care for the, uh, those who are mistreated and those who are in prison. We were told to honor marriage. And we were told to be content in faith because Jesus has promised to never leave us or forsake us. Now as we begin in verse 7, we're going to work all the way through 16, uh, he's continuing to show us what pleasing to the Lord looks like. But he also shows us in this section how we find the strength to endure in faith in times of trial. Now, in this section, 7 through 16, the author's thought process, his argument, how he structures his argument, it's kind of hard to follow. So what we're going to do is we're going to just read the whole section, so get it in your brain, And then we're going to come back and take it apart a piece at a time and really try to follow the argument so we understand not only what he is saying to his audience, but also how it applies to us today. So let's read the text. Verse 7 through 16 says this. He just said, Jesus will never promise to never leave you, forsake you. Therefore, we can say, what can man do to me? He says, remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. 
We have an altar from which those who serve the tent or tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So, in the same way, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, because these things are true, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, therefore, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. God, we come before you today asking for clarity, asking for uh, your hand to be upon us as we walk through this text. Uh, God, we pray that you, would, um, that you would apply it to our hearts, that you show us what it means for us today and what you are calling us to do and to be and how we might deepen our understanding of the gospel of grace. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So after telling us that we can trust the promise of Christ never to leave us, never to forsake us in verses 5 and 6, verse 7 and 8 call us basically to emulate the faithfulness of godly examples. He says, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now there's some discussion about what leaders are being referred to here. Most think that these are past leaders who are no longer with this Hebrew church because it says they had spoken. Those who spoke, past tense, uh, the word to this church. And later in verse 17, he's going to tell the Hebrews to obey their leaders now. But these leaders, he calls them to remember them. So he seems to be referring to those who had led them in earlier days, but now have completed their service and have already finished the race, to use uh, his vocabulary. Uh, specifically, he wants these Hebrew Christians to consider, to, to think deeply about the outcome of their way of life. To remember how they endured in faith to the end. This text is not just, just saying, remember them and consider what they taught you. Remember what they taught you, although that's certainly included. He tells the reader to consider the outcome, the result, the sum total of their way of life. Think back to their trials and their struggles and how they endured in faith and how they finished well enduring in that faith. Consider the impact of their way of life and what it made uh, in your life and in others' life, in the kingdom of God. And when he says imitate their faith, he isn't just telling them to mimic their behavior or do what they did. He's saying trust Jesus as they trusted Jesus. Let what you've seen in their lives be the pattern of faith and, and, and practice that you model. So after listing all of these biblical heroes in chapter 11, the writer's now calling his readers to remember those faithful examples that they knew personally. Everyone in here, in this room today, unless you were knocked off your donkey on the road to Damascus, you have had people in your life who spoke the word to you, who impacted your life for Christ. Preachers, Sunday school teachers, parents, grandparents, friends. Everyone has someone that Christ has used in your life. You, you've seen someone in your family, in, in your churches, in your, your circle of friends who, who has endured hardship in faith, who has, has gone through sickness, who has gone through trials and, and held fast to Christ all the way to the end. In our own church, uh, I've had the privilege of seeing many endure in faith and finish well over the last seven years that I've been the pastor here. I could share story after story after story after story with you. For example, the one that came to mind as I was reading through this, there's several, and I, we could point to many, many examples. But 
The one that came to my mind was Bob Cox. A lot of you, if you've only been here two or three or four or five years, you probably don't know Bob. Uh, Bob was old and he was infirmed when I got here in December of 2017. It took Bob ten minutes to walk to his seat from that north door over there where Sue, his wife, would drop him off and go park the car. He walked with a cane and he barely could move. I mean, he, he was just a little bitty step at a time. We had some long walks and conversations together just between here and this door. And so he came every Sunday though. He was here every Sunday. What made him so faithful to live for the Lord through all that? In fact, Bob and Sue Cox attended this church for 40 something years and about a year before Bob died and about two years before Sue died they said, you know what? That's not what they said. <laughs> they said, we've never actually joined this church. We've never actually covenanted ourselves with this body of believers. So after 40-something years of faithful service to Christ and faithful service in this particular church... They came down on the, to the front on a Sunday morning. Sue was pushing Bob in a wheelchair. And they made, a year before he died, he made, they made the God-honoring covenant to membership with this body of believers at the very end of their lives. They didn't have to do that. They had been invested in FBC for so long, serving Christ here for so long, nobody even knew they weren't members. But they did. And they wanted to honor God all the way to the end. I could walk you through a list of people at First Baptist Church who finished well. And the outcome of their faith, of their way of life, still speaks of the faithfulness of Christ. And all of you in here have stories of someone who endured in faith, who impacted your life. The text says, remember them. Think deeply on how they lived and the outcome or the impact their way of life had upon you. Believe Christ like they believed Christ. But how does remembering and considering a other's outcome of faith help us run with endurance? Which is his point all through the book of Hebrews. Run with endurance. Don't turn from Christ. Don't drift away. How does remembering them help us? Because verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus that empowered them to, to go through these things and led them through the valley of the shadow of death is the same Jesus whom you depend on in faith today. The lives and the teachings of those we remember is still relevant because the same Jesus they trusted is trustworthy today. You can imagine why these Hebrew Christians suffering so needed to hear this. Years ago, this, this church, which probably was a little church in Rome, at the very end of the letter, he's going to say, those in Italy greet you. This little church began with the gospel breaking through into people's hearts. There was joy and passion and fervent faith in the Messiah who had come to deliver his people. All that is said earlier in the book of Hebrews. There was all of this joy, yet as the years went by and persecution came and Trials increased and suffering began more and more and hardships. It, it's easy to get worn down. It's easy just to get tired and become doubtful. You know, it, it, I don't see the victory everywhere. I don't see the glorious nature of this salvation that I hear on the Christian radio station every day. All that victorious faith and service kind of fades in the minds who can't see anything now but struggles and sufferings. Where did all that fire for Christ go and that, that passion for His name go? Where did it go? The author's calling them back to their senses. Jesus has not changed. You can think, you, you can't think that, you know, well, well today's a different time. We have different battles, and some of that may be true. You can't say things were different back then 
in struggles and sufferings. That was a different time. Those were different struggles. Those old saints didn't have to go through what I have to go through. There's a theological word for that kind of understanding. It's baloney. What those godly examples and faithful followers did by faith, you can do as well. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Earlier in verse 5, this same Jesus promised He would never leave you or forsake you. So the writer's saying, imitate their faith. Trust Jesus as they trusted Him. And you will find Him as faithful to you all the way to the end as they did. But in order to do that, to finish well, to endure to the end in faith, we have to be strengthened by God's grace from our altar. I know that's, that's kind of weird sounding, so stay with me and let me walk you through the text and show you where I got that. This, this is kind of a convoluted section, so we're going to take it a piece at a time and really follow the thought process of the author. So he says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then he says, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace. He says, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Then he says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tent, the tabernacle, have no right to eat. Okay, so let's take it a piece at a time. First, he says, don't be led away by these diverse and strange teachings. He's been saying that all through the book of Hebrews. Don't drift away. Don't turn your back on Christ and go to these other things. He's, uh, he's telling the Hebrews, once again, not to go back to the, the old covenant law, the old way of life, or any other teaching that they may turn from Christ to follow. Because, he says, for... It's good. We need to have our hearts strengthened by grace and not by foods. Now, we'll talk about what it means to have our hearts strengthened by grace in just a minute. But first, why is he talking about food? Why is he talking about diverse teachings and then foods here? The, the writer hasn't changed the subject here in the last chapter. He's still talking about the Jewish Old Covenant practices that these Hebrew Christians were being tempted to go back to to have a better life, to have a more comfortable life without persecution. With many of the offerings um, uh, the, and the sacrificial offerings of the Old Covenant, the priests and the people, would, they were allowed to eat portions of the animal. The, the sacrificial meal was a, a, a big thing in several of the different sacrifices in Old Covenant Israel. There was benefit and there was blessing in those sacrificial feasts. So being strengthened spiritually by foods refers to eating these sacrificial meals from the offerings at the altar of the tabernacle and the temple. That's why he says, after referring to foods, we have an altar that those who serve the tabernacle don't have a right to eat from. So eating from the sacrifices was, it was necessary in the Old Covenant. It was necessary to faithfully worship God. It was necessary to be right before God. The writer has mentioned this before in chapter 9. As he's speaking of the Old Covenant and the worship through the tabernacle sacrifices, in chapter 9, verse 9, he says, According to this arrangement, meaning the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the feasts, all of that, he says, Gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. But look, they deal only with food and drink and various washings. And he categorizes the food, the drink, and the washings as regulations for the body that are imposed until the time of Reformation, which is the New Covenant. So what he's saying is draw your spiritual strength from the grace of Jesus Christ not from these regulations and these rituals and these rites and observances and these religious things, not from the animal offerings that you want to go back to in the Old Covenant, which are now obsolete. He's saying spiritual strength to endure and live faithfully, trusting Christ and holding fast 
to Christ. It doesn't come from sacrificial observances or rituals or feasts or anything other, anything other than the grace of God. And he says, to kind of buttress this, we have an altar. Don't go back to that altar. We have an altar that those folks who serve at the tabernacle altar can't eat from. We have an altar that we do eat from. And it's not animal sacrifices. The Levitical priests and the Jews living in the Old Covenant right now that these Hebrew Christians were surrounded by and that they were tempted to go back to, they don't have a right to eat the sacrificial meal from our altars, what the writer's saying. Now hang on. So we, we Christians have an altar that we eat from? Where, where is our altar? And how do we eat from it to be strengthened by grace? So let's follow the thread. He says, we have an altar they can't eat from. And then verse 11 says, for, because... The bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. He's talking about the Day of Atonement sacrifices in the Old Covenant. So, in the same way, Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So stop right there for a second. So verse 11 is referring to the sacrifices made on the Day of Atonement. When on that day, all of the nation's sins were covered. Bulls and goats were used as, as sacrificial sin offerings. Their blood was brought into the holy place in the tabernacle. It was sprinkled on the altar. But on that day, on the Day of Atonement, nobody got to eat from those animals. No one ate of the meat of those animals. Not the priests, not the people, not anybody. Portions of it were burned on the bronze altar in the courtyard. But the rest of those animals were taken outside the camp and they were burned completely. All this is found in Leviticus 16 if you want to read more about it. Verse 27 of Leviticus 16 says, And the bull for the sin offering, this is on the day of atonement, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin, their flesh, and their dung shall be burned up with fire. The people of Israel were forbidden from eating any of the sacrifices on the day of atonement. So the writer's saying, by comparing... These sacrifices that nobody can eat from, but they were taken outside the camp and burned, he's comparing those to the fulfillment in Jesus. He's saying Jesus is our atonement offering, our day of atonement. Just like that offering on the day of atonement that cleansed all the people of their sin, the writer of Hebrews say, it says, so in the same way, Jesus suffered outside the gate. He's talking about the cross on the hill of Calvary outside the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is the perfect Day of Atonement sacrificial offering. He's fulfilled it. Jesus brought His blood into the real Holy of Holies and the body, His body was sacrificed outside the earthly city of Jerusalem, the camp of Israel. And, and the writer says... He suffered on the cross outside the camp of Israel in order to make us holy, to sanctify us by His own blood. In Leviticus, outside the camp was not a place of holiness. It was a place of defilement. The men who took the animals outside the camp and burned them, they had to wash themselves before they could come back into the camp. Calvary outside of the city of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified was a place of defilement, not of holiness. Yet God's holy son, his perfect sacrificial lamb, entered into what was unholy and defiled and he made it holy, sanctifying us with his own blood. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. I know it's kind of convoluted. The writer's point is that the cross is our altar. And unlike the people on the Day of Atonement, and unlike the people who continue in the Old Covenant religion, he's saying we get to eat from this altar. They can't eat from our altar. Eating from this altar is where we are strengthened by grace and not by food. He's talking about the cross. 
In verse 13 and 14, he says this. Let me back up. He says, therefore, so make sure you see the thought. So he says, we have an altar that they can't eat from. Then in verse 11, he describes the old covenant day of atonement, burned outside the camp. And verse 13, he describes the altar that we have, Jesus, who is outside the camp and sanctifies us. He says, because we have this altar of the cross, of the gospel, verse 13, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We have an altar that they can't eat from. We are strengthened by grace from our altar, the gospel, the cross. Not by f sacrificial meals, not by liturgy, not by ceremonial observances, not by any of these other things. He says, so let's go out to our altar. Let's go to the cross and feast upon the sacrifice that frees us from sin and condemnation. Just as the writer said in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, let us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He's saying be strengthened by the grace of the cross so you will endure to the end. So you will hold fast to Christ by grace through faith in Him. The gospel itself strengthens us as we continually feed upon it, nourishing our souls in the fact that we are sinners undeserving of anything and that Jesus Christ has given us perfect righteousness before the Father. But make sure you understand, Hebrew Christians... When you go out to this altar, when you go out to Him outside the camp, that ensures that you're going to bear the same reproach that He endured. He says, let's go out to Him outside the camp and bear the reproach He endured. Don't think it's strange that you suffer in this life. Don't think it's strange that you endure trials or that you're persecuted. He says, endure them as Christ did. And as those who have gone before you have done, as you remember their way of life, go out to the altar, the cross, the place too shameful to be placed inside the camp. Go out to Him because Jesus is better. He's calling these Jewish Christians to come out from the camp of Israel and go to the cross. And even though this involves hardship and trial and suffering and enduring the reproach that he endured, the point of the book of Hebrews is that the reproach that you're enduring, the suffering that you're enduring, it's worth the price a million times over because Jesus is better. So here's the question posed to the reader. Are you willing to join Christ outside the camp? Are you willing to accept his reproach from your family, your friends, your Jewish kinsmen? Are you willing to forsake the comforts of the world, if that be called for? And the sinful flesh, which definitely is called for, because Jesus is better? Are you willing to come as a beggar to this king of kings and just receive grace? Jesus is better, he says, and it's good. For the heart to be strengthened by grace because nothing else will strengthen you. We try to feed on so many things from the world. Good things, bad things, all kinds of things to find our peace, our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our purpose in this life. It is the grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone that strengthens you to hold fast to Christ. And we do that because we're not looking forward to an earthly city. He's telling these Jewish Hebrew Christians, this city, this earthly city that you're wanting to go back to, this tabernacle, this, all this, t the temple, the, what you're wanting to go back to, we're not looking forward to that. Nothing of this earth will last, not even those old holy places. We seek the city that's to come, the new Jerusalem, the Mount Zion, which will come down out of heaven. And it's by faith alone in Jesus that we become citizens of that city.
Now, I know that's, a, that's kind of a hard argument to follow. So you and maybe the Hebrew readers who first read it might say, okay, I think I understand what you're saying. You're saying now that we're Christians, we no longer worship God with sacrifices. The writer's saying now, because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, we are to continually worship with spiritual sacrifices. So follow the thread. Okay? Jesus same. Remember your leaders. Jesus is same yesterday, today, and forever. We have an altar they can't eat from. So just like the Day of Atonement when the animals were burned outside the camp, Jesus was crucified outside the camp. So let's go to Him outside the camp and bear that reproach because our city is a city to come. And then He says in verse 15, Through Him... Then, therefore, because of all of what I just said, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. And then he says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Our whole lives are now lived offering spiritual sacrifice. Now, before we talk about what these are, make sure you notice those first two words in verse 15. Through Him we offer sacrifices. There's no need to offer any sacrifice for atonement or forgiveness or uh, the removal of sins because Jesus Christ has paid the entire price through His once for all time sacrifice. Our spiritual sacrifices are only acceptable when we offer them through Him, through Jesus, who cleanses us by His blood. So first he says, real quick, says we're to continually offer the sacrifice of praise. And then he tells us what it is. It's the fruit of our lips. The fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. God sees our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving as, as spiritual sacrifice. And it's pleasing to Him through Christ. In Psalm 50, I want to show you this is not just a New Testament idea. Psalm 50, a lot of us know Psalm 50 because of the whole cattle thing. But God says that the, to the people, I'm not going to accept any more bulls and goats. He says, I'm not going to accept any of your sacrifice because I already own the cattle on a thousand hills. And then he tells them in Psalm 50, verse 14, he said, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And perform your vows. In verse, tw in verse 23 of Psalm 50, he says, The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. So, he tells us in verse 15 of Hebrews 13, we're to praise God with gratitude and thankfulness, giving Him the fruit of our lips, meaning we are called to speak. We're called to proclaim. We are called to sing. Sometimes men don't like singing. I understand. But it's not a suggestion. You're commanded to sing. Ephesians 5.19 commands us to sing in the gathered assembly. We are called to verbally declare and acknowledge His name and His glory. Through speaking, through proclaiming, through singing, through all of the things. The fruit of your lips. That is a spiritual sacrifice we offer which is pleasing to God. Because Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin. And secondly, verse 16, he says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. He tells us to offer the sacrifice of doing good and sharing what you have. And he says, these kinds of sacrifices are pleasing to God. Make sure that you don't get it twisted. How are they pleasing to God to do good works? Through Him. Because Jesus has paid our sin debt. And this idea doesn't come out of the blue either. In chapter 10, he told us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves together, but to spur one another to love and good works. Last week in chapter 13, verses 1 through 6, first three verses told us to show brotherly love, to not neglect hospitality, and to care for those who are mistreated in prison. Jesus said, when you've done this... For the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So these sacrifices please God. We are to, we are to share with one another, he says. 
invest our lives with one another. Sharing as any has need. Sharing the fruit of the Spirit with one another. Investing our lives together. Sharing the burdens of those who have burdens. These are the sacrifices that please God. Now that Jesus has paid our sin debt. Jesus said the Father is seeking those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's the reason He saved you. To glorify Him by living sacrificially unto Him, offering Him a, a life of worship, presenting our bodies as living sacrifices which glorify His name and reflecting His image on the earth. Yet it only, it's only through Christ that any offering that we make is acceptable or pleasing. Jesus alone cleanses us from the defilement of sin and strengthens us in grace. So to these suffering, hurting, persecuted, and, and wavering Hebrew Christians, the author says, don't go back. Don't go back to your old life. Don't go back to that dead religion. Don't go back to just going through the motions. You have an altar outside the camp. Go to the cross where Jesus paid for your sin. Be strengthened by grace, not by these religious things that you do. Feast upon His body and blood and draw strength in your time of need so that you can endure and do what is pleasing to the Lord even when it hurts. Come to the altar and be healed. Entrust yourself to Christ. Let us offer spiritual sacrifices pleasing to God as we endure in faith to the end. And finish well. Pay attention to what you've heard in the gospel lest you drift from it. He told us earlier. Find your strength in the grace of God. In the grace of the gospel. That's the growing Christian life. The one that is deepening in their understanding. And their faith. And their walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trust in Christ is not just what we tell unbelievers. It's what we tell each other when we endure hardship, when we go through trials, when we're struggling, when we're bearing burdens. Trust in Jesus is everything. Today, if you don't know Christ, trust in Jesus is your only salvation, that he died for my sin, that he rose from the grave, and that he paid my price. Believer, trust in Jesus is the way we grow. It's the way that we become mature Christians, if you want to say it that way. Let's trust in Jesus together. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the opportunity to get to share your word. I'm not sure that I made it very, very clear, but God, your word is your word, and it doesn't return void. So I pray that even just the words that we have read from chapter 13, God, would, you would use to do your work in the hearts of us all that we would come to trust in you. God, that we would turn from trying to live by our own works as our hearts are bent to do. And God, when we find ourselves faltering, that we would go back out to our altar. That we would go kneel at the cross. That we would find our peace and our sufficiency there where your son gave his life to provide it. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that hasn't trusted in you, maybe they're just trying to do better, be better, live a better life, turn over a new leaf and get things right, impossible. God, I pray that you would show them the gospel. Show them they must have an atonement for all of their sin. And Jesus is the only payment. Father, I pray that you'd call them to yourself and that you would save souls today as they trust in you. Help us to be who you've called us to be because you've given us all things and Jesus really is better. We thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, I'll stand right down here if you want to come. Will you stand as we sing?